So, um, very, very warm welcome to this month's Wake Up and Wake Up Speak Up. For those of you, uh, you who have not met yet, I'm Aman Zaidi. Vandana likes to call me Merlin because I help people find the great hero within themselves. Uh, she also likes to call me the Falcon because I see the bird's eye view and I help others see it too, especially how things are connected. I can see Adit smiling because you know he and I were talking about my strength of connectedness uh, just this last weekend. So thanks to Vandana for those nicknames. Um, and thanks, Aman. And I'm Vandana Saxenaporia. And for those of you who don't know me, I'm known as the human alarm clock, as I'm consistently aiming to wake people up. Um, I'm also known as a porcupine because I like poking people and getting them to think in different directions. Especially me. Uh, she <laughs> does have a great time poking uh, me. But anyway, so what we do on Wake Up Speak Up every month is that we take the topic that is of importance to us and we examine it. And we ask, why aren't people waking up and speaking up about it in a way that makes a difference to our lives directly? This time, we are talking about mainstreaming mental health. Yeah, and the research shows us that mental health conditions are increasing in number and variety. A whopping 86% of people who answered our Twitter and LinkedIn polls said that they had dealt with or are currently dealing with mental health challenges. And that's backed up by a US study that says that 80% um, are dealing with um, or have dealt with anxiety and 50% with depression. And all I can say to that is, ouch. Yeah, and you know, that's, uh, those, are, those are not generic uh, you know, numbers. Uh, those, those are not figures about, okay, America specific uh, population. This is about people in the workplace. These studies have been conducted by people in the workplace. So it's very possible, you know, if in this group, it's very possible that about 85% of us have dealt with some kind of uh, mental health challenge and are still trying to you know, grapple with it. So uh, it's, it's actually worsening. It's not being mainstreamed fast enough. And what we mean by mainstreamed is that it, it is not being incorporated into organizational key result areas. It is not being taught in schools. Taboos around mental health are not being addressed. It's still not safe to talk about it. You know, like it is safe to talk about uh, diabetes, for example. And uh, for example, I also know that uh, there is somebody who has a mental health challenge and is currently looking for a job. Here's a quick question. Would anybody feel confident giving that person a job? Yeah, and so what we really wanted to do was do something slightly different this time. We want to talk, we really want to get us breaking up into groups and talking about how can we bring it into the mainstream? How can we normalize this? And how can we also ensure that mental health stays as a priority despite our busy schedules? And how do we also prevent it or help people cope with mental health challenges? So how do we organize it? So that really the name of the game is normalize, prioritize and organize for this session. So we also don't want to focus on why it is not normalized. There are enough reasons out there. Uh, there is uh, the strange stigma about mental health in the workplace, afraid of being judged, not considered for promotions, not being seen as fit for marriage and, and things like that. Yeah, and um, the point is we have to talk about it because as we said, it's almost nine out of 10. If we're saying 86% of people, we're talking about nine out of 10 people, which is practically everyone on this call has had some issue whether we admit it or not. And um, most of our struggles seem to come from the social stigmas that have really arisen from um, what we loosely term the patriarchal culture, which is all about hiding our struggles, um, you know, putting on a brave face, you know, not crying about it, being a man, being, you, you know, being strong enough. And, you know, the point is, what we're trying to say is let's stop hiding, because when we hide, other people hide. There's, um, Amin and I often talk about the law of vulnerability. When we disclose something about ourselves, then people also start disclosing. It, it gets people out of their shells. And we need to have open conversations in the workplace and within friend circles. 
I, I've actually seen this law of vulnerability firsthand repeatedly. The most recent instance being, and this will interest all of you and, and you know, probably Barkha even more. I was actually on a call uh, where um, somebody I knew was talking about methods of reducing stress and anxiety. And uh, I felt uh, compelled to share because of some of the questions that people were asking. So I put my hand up and said, hey, if anybody has questions around how, around anxiety, uh, you know, let me know because I told them that about 14 years ago, I had a panic attack and uh, I struggled with generalized anxiety disorder after that. And, and I've actually gone through the whole process of feeling really anxious and then learning techniques of how to manage it and, and then, you know, lead a better life. So I said, you know, do that. Uh, if you want to feel free to reach out to me that very night. I had two people reach out to me on LinkedIn, two people reach out to me on the phone, two of them have continued to stay in touch, uh, you know, whenever they feel uh, that they need any advice, et cetera. And, and I'm so glad that I put myself out there and said, hey, you know what, I've dealt with this. Uh, I know what it's about, give me a call if you need help. Because if I hadn't done that, those four people would not have felt safe uh, self-disclosing and seeking help. So anyway, on, on that note, I think we should really, really kick this off. I'm, I'm going to introduce uh, the first of our special guests today, Jeff Marlowe. Jeff, uh, who's an engineer by training, an organizational change consultant by choice, and a meditator for more than 30 years, originally, he says, by necessity. Jeff, uh, where did your story with mental health begin? Well, um... Good question, Aman. First of all, thank you both for, for inviting me along today. Uh, really important topic. Um, if I start to speak too fast, do let me know, because I'm aware that sometimes, you know, it, it, yeah, British English on Indian ears doesn't always land as well as it might do. I, I did a tour of companies in, in um, northern India from Amritsar down through Chandigarh down to Delhi in, in 95 after I'd been doing meditation for about five years. It was a, uh, we call it in the UK, Coles to Newcastle. So it's, it's, it's like selling refrigerators to Eskimos. So this, this was talking to uh, Indian businessmen about the benefits of meditation in management. Uh, and, at, and at one session, um, the, the guy who was the, I think it was Rotary Club session. At the end, there was myself speaking and there was a, uh, a Spanish girl speaking. So we were both speaking in English. And at the, the end of the session, the host said, I, I, excuse, excuse my Indian accent, okay. So um, the host said, thank you very much for your session this evening. We are, Jeff, we are not understanding your English. We are understanding Christina's English very well. You must be improving your English. So I'm a bit aware that it's possible. And I, I said to him, I could have tried to do it in Hindi, but mera Hindi bohot acha nahi hai. English So that's it. That's my, that's my total um, yeah, Hindi vocabulary for, for introductions. So I don't, I don't know the answer to the question, really, Aman. I mean, as a kid, there was probably some sort of stress, depression. Certainly, I can pinpoint various times in my life where I was depressed and stressed. But the story for the benefit of this session today really started sort of 30 or well, just 31 years ago. So 1989. Um, around my son's first birthday and a deep conflict I felt between desperately wanting to be because it was the only day a big client in uh, Holland could um, have a kickoff meeting for a huge consulting project that I was designated as the project manager. And so I literally felt like I was torn in half by these two conflicting desires. On the one hand, to be at Alex's birthday party, and at the other hand, on the other hand, not to let down the client and um, colleagues and firm and, and all of that. So yeah, that, that was where I really realized I had an issue that I needed to address. Interesting. So. Uh... You, you want to tell us how you actually cope with that conflict because that kind of conflict is very, very regular in the workplace. You know? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I did what I would always say a lot of guys would do in that situation is I asked my wife what I should do. So that, that was how I answered the immediate situation. I said to her, what, what do you think I should do? And she said, 
go for the meeting in Holland. And, and so immediately I'm, I'm like, well, how did she know that was the answer so quickly? And, and why is that the right answer? So I asked her why, and she said, because Alex won't even notice you're not there. And, and to me, that was like she'd taken a red hot knife and gone, because for me, in my, because I didn't have a very close relationship with my own dad. So I was determined to be a good dad to Alex. And I didn't really know what a good dad was because I hadn't had one myself. I mean, it wasn't bad, but you know, it just wasn't particularly good. Um, but I did know that what a good dad did was turned up for his son's first birthday party. So Alison telling me that he wouldn't even notice that I was not there was so, so this kind of started to give me some clues as to what was really going on at a deeper level. And, you know, long story short, ended up signed off work by my doctor with acute anxiety. Um, in fact, he asked me, what do you want me to put on a sick note? And it surprised me because I thought I am a science guy, you know, maths and engineering uh, background, maths, physics and engineering. So when a doctor um, assesses you, I, I, my, my, in my mental model, they go, oh, you've got this syndrome or you've got that syndrome. And when he actually asked me, what do you want me to put on your sick note? I was like, well, don't you know what it is? So again, it was kind of a, a, a real slap in the face for my belief that if eventually it got to the point where I had to press the emergency stop button and get off the treadmill temporarily, at least the doctor would know what the problem was and what to do about it. So I went through all of that and the psychotherapist and he didn't know what was wrong. And I was like, what do I do now? But of course, life sometimes softens you up so that you will look in a different direction. And that was when I stumbled across meditation and um, the young lady who um, I met that very first evening, I, I was her first student. So she'd been meditating for a couple of years. She was a, a, a secretary, worked as a PA in a temping agency. And uh, her comment to me when I described this situation of feeling like I was torn into two by Jeff the dad versus Jeff the consultant, um, she said to me, oh, that's easy. And I'm like, what do you mean it's easy? I've just been to see the guy who runs psychotherapy at the Cambridge University Teaching Hospital, and he doesn't know what's wrong with me. If he doesn't know what's wrong with me, how can you, with no qualifications whatsoever, have any insight whatsoever to what's wrong? And she said, oh, you know, your problem is you don't know who you are. Sorry, I think I do. I've, I have certificates. I can bring them in and show you if you like. Uh, and she said, no, no. She said, the problem is you think that you are Jeff Alexander. You think you're Alexander's dad. You think you're Alison's husband. You think you're Sadie and Arthur's son. You think you're Mary and Anne's brother. Whereas those are all roles that you play. And you're the actor who plays all those roles. And it was literally like a 10 kilowatt light bulb went on inside my head. And I could see the truth of this. I, I, don't, I, don't, I find it so hard to describe the experience, but the experience was, oh my God, this is absolutely the truth about myself. And, and it was like, I was seeing it for the first time. So all this fragmentation into all these different roles suddenly was into this one core self that was clearly behind all of those roles. And so that just got me fascinated because I realized there was a body of knowledge and a body of understanding here that could help me get to grips with who is the me behind all of these masks that I wear in everyday life. And of course, as an engineer, if somebody shows you the circuit diagram or if somebody suggests that they might have the software listing or if somebody thinks, you know, here is the repair manual for the self, I'm like, right, you know, where's the bit that's busted? How do I fix it? So that, that was kind of how I got into this, this path. So it's, it's really interesting. I'm, I'm personally quite fascinated by, uh, by this, Jeff, because, you know, I, I also um, spoke to a couple of therapists and unfortunately from, you know, the, the field of psychotherapy, uh, you don't get these kind of insights. So anyway, the, the point I'm trying to, I want to hear from you is once you discovered this, how did it help you? How did this knowledge contribute to better well-being for you? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So I mean, the thing that really was like, apart from that immediate aha, what, what really worked for me, and again, because I, I'm far too clever for my own good, right? My IQ is 154. 
which is something like one in 6,000 people. So when you teach me about meditation, the last thing I do is actually meditate. What I do is I think about meditation. Uh, in fact, in those days, we didn't have the internet, but if we had, the first thing I would have done is I would have been onto Amazon to see what's the best selling book on meditation. And I'd be consuming videos from Sadhguru and anybody else that I could find, you know, like it would just be more and more information. So what I realized very early on is um, once you understand this, so this is, I, I promised some dodgy Sanskrit, okay? So there's a set of words that, that have very specific meanings in terms of understanding consciousness. We don't have this understanding in Western psychology, Western philosophy. In fact, I'm gonna be a bit rude to Western psychology and Western philosophy and say, most of the insight that we actually have is from people who studied Eastern philosophy, often Vedic philosophy, and translated it into something that Westerners could understand. So, but, but, the, but for me, these core issues are, there's, there's a concept of, um, of something right at the core of consciousness, this word smriti. So there's a set of words that rhyme, smriti, vritti, drishti, kriti, srishti, um, sanskriti. There's a whole kind of set of, it's a system if you like, and what it says is that Smriti is basically your sense of who you are based on your memories of the past. And, and that sense of who you are is the thing that creates the eyes through which you see. So the Drishti it creates the attitude that you have towards the world, Vritti. It, it dictates what you regard as the action you should perform, Kriti. Ultimately, that creates the culture around you, Sanskriti. And so the world that you see, the creation that you create through your consciousness, Srishti, and of course, that then plays back on your smriti, because if that's the world you see, you see yourself at the center of that world. So there's this, it's basically a systemic whole that keeps you in place. So for, for people who are not into that sort of language, the, the metaphor I often use is that um, when a veterinary surgeon looks at a pig, the pig looks like a patient. When a pig farmer looks at the pig, it looks like money. When the butcher looks at the pig, it looks like meat. Right. If you're if you're um, Jewish or uh, Vaishnav or, you know, it's not it's not food. Right. So it's kind of like the aware. It, we don't see things as they are. We see them as we are. That's the thing. And so what I could do, even though I couldn't meditate, because if I sat down to meditate, I'd just think what I could do is I could notice the content of my awareness moment by moment and go, ah, if I'm seeing that, that means I have turned up in this smriti. Well, the moment you're observing that you're no longer trapped in it. You're free of it because you become the observer of it. So it was practicing what is often called like sort of witnessing consciousness or sakshi, but practicing it with that kind of Western educated engineers perspective on life. So that was my practice. And so I started to notice, oh, I'm getting caught up in these particular ways. I'm getting caught up in the identity of my role. I'm getting caught up in being sort of the you know, junior to my boss. And then, of course, I could start to see that that was what was happening with my clients as well in my consulting work, that executives would get trapped in, I am the decision maker. And then they would become a bottleneck for decision making. And then they would get stressed because they had to be the one making the decisions. So that's how it all started to work in practice. That's pretty awesome, Jeff. Thanks. Thanks so much. Um, you know, I, I see a few parallels uh, in what uh, Western psychotherapy calls cognitive behavioral therapy. I think the only problem is that happens largely within sessions and doesn't probably filter into your daily practice. Thanks, I think thanks. that is really, really useful stuff. Um, yeah, I, I mean, that was fascinating. I, I think Tiffany's asked a question in the box. So maybe when we go into the next breakout, Jeff, you could, you could add something in there. I think that'd be really useful. I think it was um, amazing how you, um, you've related it back to um, you know, Vedic philosophy, but it, it's really funny if you come from the quantum physics angle as well, when you think about um, what happens with the observer and how things alter, it's, it's not dissimilar actually. So it's quite interesting. But um, you know, enough, enough of the three of us, I think it's time for us to kind of interact a bit more. Remember the whole purpose of this session is waking up and speaking up. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna shift into breakout rooms where we don't want you to dwell on um, and kind of discuss the reasons why mental health has not been mainstreamed, but really to draw on insights and think about what 
you think can be done to alter it. So we don't want you saying things like, well, schools should bring it in. Focus on what you personally can do and why it would be beneficial to do that. So what we're going to do is in this first breakout session that we're going to have for about 10 minutes, uh, we're going to split into very small groups and we're going to look at how do we normalize mental health? How do we get people talking about it and taking the stigma out? So I think Aman's gonna um, cut and paste three key questions in the chat box to you. The first question is, what mental health challenges are people not talking about and should be spoken about? That's our first question. The second is, how can we encourage people to talk about it in the workplace? What would encourage people to actually talk about it? And the third is, do we need to change the nomenclature and the terminology to get people to open up? Um, and by that, I mean, um, I, I, one of my clients in Delhi, uh, one of the large banks, you know, they, they had a lot of employees who were saying, we're really stressed. And so they employed a counselor, but, um, you know, where it, when it said counselling room and counsellor available, they were like, uh, no, nobody signed up. But when they changed the name of that person to the stress coach, then loads of people started signing up. So is there something that we need to change? So three questions there. Glenda's now going to put us into breakout rooms and we've got 10 minutes to kind of discuss. Um, how do we normalise this? And if you can focus on those three questions, then we'll come back and see what we can share. Glenda, over to you. Welcome, welcome back everyone. I know, you know, 10 minutes is always too short. It's such a nightmare because you only just get into the conversation. Um, but you know, part of the reason of, of doing this as Wake Up, Speak Up is to just get you to that point where we start talking because hopefully then your subconscious is gonna be thinking about it. You'll think about writing, you'll realize that people are going through similar things. Um, what we'd love you to do is to put into your, in, into the chat box, any of the insights that you got from that session. It might have been, wow, I don't feel so crazy anymore because it seems like everyone else is going through it or you know anything, any answers to any of those questions or anything else that you, um, th that you got out. So if you can just you know type any comments um, in in the um, chat box while while you're doing that I mean one of the things that I will um, mention is you know there's an M word that women don't talk about especially when men are present uh, but I'm going to talk about it I mean last week I had this huge break breakdown um, because I'm going through the menopause at the moment and I was totally overwhelmed and I knew it was my hormone levels but that doesn't make it any easier and I was as Jeff said the observer watching and I was like how long is this going to go on for is this going to stay you know etc cetera, etc cetera. but you know the, the thing is um that fantastic expression which is this too shall pass and you know taking each step as it comes taking each day as it comes and and you know this time this week i am a completely different person to who i was this time last week um and those are things that happen so i know we've got people who are um who, who have written some comments down so um jeff do you want to pick one of the comments <clears throat> oh you're on mute no, you, you caught me on the hop there, Vanda, and I was actually typing a comment, oh, and okay. well, now, I, now I have to look at the comments. Amen. No, no, why don't you finish, Jeff? I'll pick something. I'm, uh, you know, I'm very, I'm actually curious to understand a little more for, of what Nitin has put in the comment box. Yeah, Nitin? Come on, I, yeah. You know, we were discussing in our room, if that's the context uh, you're inviting me to speak about, is what I feel today is, one of the things that's happening at a very regular interval and it's seen all across is people having this mid-career clutter. I'm not even calling it a mid-career crisis. And that's that one of the reasons that's happening. I was talking to Jeff and in the Indian context, what I'm trying to realize is it's happening because there is a certain amount of alternatives available. If you went one or two generations back and asked an average Indian professional man, what is your, what, how are you feeling in mid-career? I mean, he would say at 65, my career is over. I joined at 19 or 20 and 65, I'm retiring. That's only the thing I'm supposed to do. So when the survival is guaranteed because of various things, when the economy is opening up and you have various alternatives, you are wondering as to whether you are on the right path or not. That's my point number one. So the conversations that definitely need to be there 
we don't i don't think that we should call it a crisis or some unhappiness it is just that mid career clutter means i am asking myself time and again maybe start of 35 or so or 30 also whether i am what i'm doing is this something that i need to do is this something that i'm enjoying so these kind of conversations should be more and more encouraged that's what i feel and the second thing i i am feeling is that our need to be perfect our need to uh, be moving around in the ambiguous is slowly reducing that's my thought it could be right it could be wrong because we want a certain amount of surety we want a certain predictability so right from a google map when i need to go to aman's house google map needs to tell me it's going to take me 35 minutes mm-hmm. and 35 minutes means 35 minutes if it becomes 36 i start becoming impatient so my my ability to handle ambiguous situations is only going down as the society technology etc is progressing and because of that we get panic the panic button gets pressed much earlier than what it was supposed to be so if you meet some old generation indian folks the grandmothers and the you know grandfathers they seem to be totally unaffected by what's happening around they say everything will happen don't worry what are you getting worked up about but today the uh, children are getting worked up the parents are getting worked up one zoom call or one uh, the child is not able to log in on something the parent is creating the whole halla gulla there and the mother is telling the father the internet is already bad the dad is expecting as if a whole bsc or a phd degree has gone while well, what is gone is a connection for 5 minutes so yeah i mean these are my thoughts i'm uh, happy to listen to somebody else also. yeah no thanks for sharing that i think uh, what you're what you're saying part of what you're saying that struck me was uh, nitin that the workplace has ceased to be a safe space you know what used to happen let's say 30 years ago you could actually afford to have a career in one single place um, you know that that concept has gone away and um, and of course the other thing is there's this proliferation of masculine values of predictability and you know and ambition and all of that stuff which is contributing it to it thank you uh jeff what comments did you want to pick or um, you know talk about yeah i think the thing that struck my um or caught my eye was um something that barker put in about um we're still far away from normalizing the stigma uh, stigmatization and we should change the name to mental well-being and, and i guess what that triggered for me is um about three no four years ago now i was 25 kg heavier than i am now and i just i had this moment i call it my heart attack hill moment where i was traveling my son and i walked up a very steep hill um while we were on vacation on holiday Uh, and the locals call it heart attack hill and i got to the top and i hadn't had a heart attack uh, and i thought oh m- maybe i'm not past it so i decided that i would lose weight and get fit it was just like one of those life changing moments but as a consequence of that what i discovered is as i started to get fit and and lost the weight a lot of the little niggles that i'd just become used to twinges in my shoulder and various pains in the body started to go away So what it made me realize is we may not deal with negativity we may not deal with negative experiences because they're not bad enough for us to have to do something about them but when you develop your level of fitness so in this case physical fitness but today we're talking about maybe mental fitness you actually take in your stride a lot of the things that are just starting to niggle at you and so i wonder if you know that's really where we need to get to is is people having the perception of the mind is a place where you deliberately just as you do with your body you deliberately take care of what you put in it by way of food in terms of your thoughts and what exercise you give it in terms of building its strength building its muscles if you like um so that when problems come along as they always do you can take them in your stride as opposed to just about coping with just about every day and then when something comes that you weren't expecting it really hits you hard mm-hmm. but I, i don't know uh, yeah i mean that was what that was what struck me i don't know if barker wanted to speak to that but um 
Well, yeah, I'd, I'd love to bring Barca in now, actually. Um, Barca's our other very special guest, and she's um, a psychologist. She's uh, trained in trauma, as well as other areas, and she runs a very successful uh, clinic in Pune. Uh, Barca, thank you, first of all, for joining us. I know how busy you are in almost back-to-backs, um, so fantastic to have you here. And, you know, the big thing is a lot of us get sucked into... In, into life, I'm calling it, you know, call after call. Um, and we realized that we've been stuck at our computer all day. Um, you know, Tiffany talked about this and so did Zaha, that you you just get so caught up in everything. Um, and, and mental health doesn't get prioritized. And a large chunk of humanity has this problem. We know that we're supposed to do it. We know that we have to do it. But how do we actually do it? Um, so speaking and responding to both of you. Yeah. Thank you for having me. And uh, some of you have uh, trashed some amount of Western psychology, but uh, uh, I, as somebody who studied psychology (laughs) in India and philosophy in India, Indian philosophy, and then going to the US and studying um, psychology um, in the Western world, the good thing now is that it is kind of merging because of neuropsychology, right? Because now we have realized that a lot of Eastern stuff actually has neuro backing. We are moving towards that and finding hopefully this common space where the body is really important, right? So Western psychology often studied the mind as separate from the body in some ways, whereas we know everything originates in the body. And why I say that is because it feels like mental health has been equated with mental disease. That means we will look at something when things go wrong. That means if there's depression, let's focus on it. If there's anxiety, let's focus on it. So it's not really a mental health conversation at all. It's a mental disease model that we are all stuck in. Mental health means prevention. Let's not get to a place of depression. Let's not get to a place of anxiety. I'll give you an example. And Mandana, you and I have discussed this before. Uh, High functioning anxiety in the world is almost... uh, revered we look up to it people who can do a lot and be everywhere and do everything so if we are going to romanticize like workaholics and romanticize uh, high functioning anxiety when do we really worry about somebody even a workplace starts worrying about one of their employees when performance stops right when performance is impacted so instead of only having performance management conversations how's your performance we need to do also like emotional check-ins how are you feeling how are you burnt out? What? And at a personal level, we need to do these check-ins with ourselves almost every day, right? Like, how is my body feeling? Why don't I feel like getting out of bed? Or why do I have so much more energy today? What was different? If we listen to our body, we can map how we are doing and then see, like, like uh, some people spoke, meditation for me also. I had ADHD or whatever is known as ADHD now, which was actually, I got, it was almost like, because I could do so many things and like there was there was a lot of benefit in fact that I got from that so the first time a psychologist went because it was compulsory for us to be in therapy told me to sit and meditate I was thinking my first thought was am I meditating well enough like am I thinking the way I should be thinking and that's not meditation at all so all those things only come to us when we tune in with our body. So at a personal level, obviously, if you're not tuning into our body, like uh, even food, look at our relationship with food, right? It's changed. We don't listen to how much we want to eat. We eat based on how much is served to us. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> right? Our body has a mechanism to tell us we need to cry now. We, need, we are hungry now. We are full now. But instead of tuning in, we have completely tuned out of our bodies so that would be definitely the first step for anybody who wanted to check in with themselves is tune in with your body and I I think that's a great one but how do you do this Barakha how do you bring that awareness um that that makes it more um you know sort of conducive how how do we do that Uh, Well, I can tell you what I do. I don't think that the same way has to work for everybody. I know different clients respond to different things as well in my practice. Um, What I started because I couldn't meditate was just body mapping, like mapping where I felt tension, where I felt good, 
it just started with a simple body mapping thing for me but i know for many clients who especially intellectual they sometimes have to journal and write to get into what is happening with them so again it depends on who you are and how you approach your life and your body and your stresses right because there are people who are more cognitive and they might have to start with that route there are people who are more affect oriented very tuned into what they are feeling feeling is a great way to go or the third is sensations like i don't know what i'm thinking or feeling so let me just start with what i'm sensing that also means like who are the people that i'm around and i feel connected and alive who are the people around that i feel um you know drained or depleted what what is the difference things like that like really tuning into either the sensation feeling or the thoughts Uh, that that's really really helpful and again it's it's then all about taking time out to just be with yourself but it, some people can do it through meditation some people can do it through journaling some people can do it through body mapping some people can do it through just thinking about who gives me energy who drains me out etc etc so um so that that is um that's fantastic um there are times though where people can't kind of get the answers themselves right and and i want to ask you a really honest question and that is when when do you know it's time to really see a counselor versus when um you you kind of just need to give yourself more time so again i think that you have to ask yourself so for example right when people are in panic i would never tell them to meditate because i'm going to increase the panic that they are experiencing so i'm going to do things to see if they can ground first if you just ground that's great because uh, you know i think meditation cannot be a one size fits all like how we even um, breathe do we breathe right in our normal breathing all that matters but of course i'm a therapist i would say start taking care of yourself start tuning into yourself at a physical and emotional level because that's the other thing even if physically we know how we are doing sometimes we don't know how we are doing emotionally right which is where affect oriented work comes or feeling oriented work um because feelings are a signal they tell you what's going on for you so if you're angry that's actually telling you something but what we do is we are culturally taught for example to not get angry so we add another feeling of shame to anger because i'm angry i'm ashamed that i'm angry so even when you go to therapy we'll we'll have to work with the shame before we can get to the anger and then what's under the anger because anger is a secondary emotion there are other emotions under it so those are called primary emotions like fear or sadness or disappointment which could be causing irritation or anger so to obviously therapy like i am a therapist i go to therapy not because there is a problem but we i just go to therapy because i feel like that keeps me grounded i don't even do it weekly i do it bi monthly but it gives me a space to talk about me because i'm holding space for so many people for some people that might be meditation for some people find time for yourself carve out time for yourself how you use that time is really up to you i'm not saying it's therapy for everybody of course there are red flags that you definitely should be seeing a therapist like if you're not coping there's signs of depression anxiety but general check ins with yourself i don't think you should wait to see a therapist to do that that should be something you do you uh, like i know clients who benefited much more from vipassana than therapy that's also fine right like it's what works for you yeah. because some people need to talk and process some people process differently as long as you're taking time out to process the problem i feel in western cultures and any any patriarchal very like competitive cultures is that uh, we tend to look outwards completely so hence not fully experiencing what we are feeling and that disconnects us from ourselves now once we are disconnected from ourselves then how do we really connect with anybody else including a therapist yeah right how do you get there fantastic you just you've just touched on something that really intrigues me which is this thing about feelings a friend of mine is a therapist runs a practice here in the UK and um, one thing that he said to me that's always stayed in my mind is in his observation he said 70% of men think their feelings So what he's saying is that you say isn't it a beautiful day today and they go it's like a little excel spreadsheet right they go tick sunny tick no clouds tick birds tick green yes it's a beautiful day whereas if you're in touch with your feelings you look and you have a feeling that it's a beautiful day i mean how, how does that land? you're nodding a lot so i can see it lands with you well but i was just wanted to 
ask your view on that. Totally. In fact, this is my biggest struggle because even when we ask clients how they're feeling, they tell us what they're thinking, right? Or even saying like, I feel hungry. That's a sensation. It's not yeah. a feeling, right? Feelings are emotions and emotions are physiological. They will rise in your body. But see, because like, suppose we, I'm an affect oriented therapist. So I work through feeling to reach where you're, how you're behaving and what is, what is therapy eventually? We want to align how you think, feel and behave right? We want to help you align how the three work out. So we can go through feeling, we can work through behavior, or we can work through thought. But really, in beginning, it's just giving an emotional vocabulary to a client. My male clients, most of the time, the overarching feeling is anger. Even when they're in pain, they're angry. So firstly, getting past the anger and being like, okay, what is under the anger? Because anger is a... Um, umbrella feeling right it has other feelings under it what's going on that takes such a long time but what is wonderful is that when my male clients get it it really impacts how they parent their boys and their children right because once they get the vocabulary it's almost like now they know what their children are feeling mm -hmm. which you know many times like again your child is in pain and sometimes you tell them okay just just move on it's fine Right? You don't zone into the pain because you never zoned into your own. We can only go as deep with someone else's feelings as we've gone uh, on our own. And I think for that, therapy is wonderful because it's like I will stop a client and say, that's a thought. Can you, can you go back to what you're feeling? <laughs> because thoughts is how we generally speak, right? Thoughts, opinions, we are all full of opinions. And uh, mm -hmm. that's the only thing we're communicating. So totally that's resonates with me. I like what you said, Barka, about anger yeah. being the default feeling, you know, and because I, I remember if I stub my toe, if I, you know, if I hurt my knee somewhere, the first thing that will come out of my mouth is that expletive say, <laughs> you know, you're hurt, <laughs> you're hurt, you're upset, you're, you're, you know, you're basically want to kick yourself for, for not, you know, watching. So you're basically judging yourself, but you don't recognize that what comes out and, Arr. <laughs> great one great one okay so listen on that note Barca thank you so much for sharing um, those amazing points um, what we're going to do is we're going to break out for 10 minutes again in smaller groups we're going to have um, uh, you know maximum of three people in a group um, 10 minutes we want to um, really get you focused on you know how can you prioritize your own mental health do you have any new ideas or insights from what Barca said from uh, the rest of what's happened in this session? Um, also, you know, where when have you had those moments where you've woken up to, um, you, you know, that aha moment that have encouraged a mental health shift, right? So two questions there, but really focused on, uh, you know, what, what now do you think you can do? Uh, uh, everything that was discussed or a new idea is coming up in your mind. Um, Glenda's gonna put us into breakout rooms for 10 minutes. So uh, Glenda, please do your magic. Just give me 30 seconds. We've had a couple of people that have lost connection. So I'm just have to move a couple of people. Okay, no worries. So uh, in the meantime, the chat box has the three uh, reflection areas that we will look at and chat about in the, in the breakout rooms. Yeah, absolutely. So start thinking about them and let's get you to break out. And then what we'll do is we'll come back. And again, as soon as you come back, start writing your comments in the box and we can pick up a few of those points and, and discuss. It'd be great to get you all to um, just write any comments down um, in the chat box. So waiting, waiting to hear from you. Um, in the meantime, um, it might be worth, Aman, do you want to kick off? You mean uh, with, with an insight I got in the chat room? Yeah, yeah. So interesting. You know, this insight has actually been formulating in my head over many years and I'm going to, you know, table it in front of Barkha, uh, you know, for her to, you know, tell me whether I'm on the right track. Here's what I've realized about mental health. Uh, deteriorating mental health is merely... Um, you know, continued, sustained, sympathetic arousal. I look at my life uh, when, you know, Barka, uh, just hear me out, okay? Uh, childhood and early youth was basically parasympathetic arousal for me. It was spent 
just lazing and chilling and climbing mountains and staring down valleys and cycling and chatting and not studying and having no projects to finish. And then work hit. And you didn't have the option of not studying and submitting anymore. You had to focus. And when you're focusing, your parasympathetic switches off, your sympathetic comes on. You're paying attention, your breath is shorter, your chest is tight, your neck is you know, tight, your jaw is tight, your throat is tight, you got cortisol, adrenaline. And then you do that for one year, two years, three years, five years, 10 years. And then essentially, you're, you know, you, you've spent 15 years in sympathetic arousal. And, um, and that, that is what, you know, bad mental health is. That's my theory. Oh, I think you're on mute. Yeah, I think there's definitely uh, a lot of value in what you're saying, Aman. Mm -hmm. um, so the thing is that, yes, like as, this, as the sympathetic nervous system gets activated, we need the parasympathetic to kind of calm down. But because we live in a sustained environment of stress, that never that's that's happening lesser and lesser for people right where the sympathetic is working over time and it's almost like the parasympathetic is not doing what it needs to do having said that there is a vagus nerve that travels from our brain to our gut which is why we're studying the brain gut connection and um, uh, within that system we actually have three kind of uh, systems one is <clears throat> the uh, Part where we feel connected, we uh, we can regulate ourselves and co-regulate, right? And that's a ventral vagal system which is activated. For that, connection is very important, right? To feel connected. Now, what is happening is we have all this arousal, but very little connection. We are getting lonelier and lonelier and lonelier. Most of our relationships, and I think I don't know how much more to stress this. Like even as a therapist, what am I? I am actually a significant relationship, a significant connection in sometimes very lonely people lives, right? Absolutely. Because we are so lonely and then we are so scared to share that we are lonely because then we seem vulnerable that we rather sit on Tinder and Bumble and have these very meaningless relationships relationships, but not expose ourselves to anything of meaning or sustenance. And human beings need connection like uh, breath and, you know, like the air that we breathe and the water that we drink. And I think when we value that, again, because of patriarchal cultures and the competitiveness, what do we admire? Independence and no form of interdependence, right? You don't need to interdepend as if like we should live as islands and then we are admired for living as an island. So it's so warped. The system is actually created for us to have mental health issues. Absolutely. We're definitely going to have mental health issues because that's the system we are creating for ourselves, Absolutely. you know, uh, of more and more loneliness and connectedness is the biggest buffer to mental health issues. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, I, I just want to... Uh, hand it back to everyone else but i just want to say and this this is what will move us in you know I, vandana and i were talking about this recently as well that how the how the school you know timetable is actually so good for mental health every 40 minutes the teacher walks out and then you yell at each other you throw stuff and you know and then the teacher walks in good morning man. that happens every 40 minutes every every couple of periods you get a break you go out you run about you kick a ball you swing from something you know, and, and you know, that was such a balanced way of living. And, and it ends the moment you start work. You know, the world of work, like you said, it's so patriarchal, masculine, all these values such as achievement, 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 just horrendous. It I'm is. done. It is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting you say that, Amon, because you and I have also discussed many times that um, I have this, if you look at my, the first time you saw my diary, my calendar, you had a heart attack. Um, because it looks like it's absolutely packed to the brim. But then you notice the blue periods, which are all my zone time. So I transition between each meeting. I don't go back to back meetings. I have to have a break in between. And that break may be just a 10 minute one where I'll listen to music or I'll go and practice the piano very badly. Um, or I'll, um, I'll just sit there and breathe um, or I'll call a friend. 
um just just to do something it's uh, so i follow a lot of the science of tibetan healing which is all about um the the physical body the um the mind and the emotional body and the energetic body and it talks about transition time that you need transition time between every activity that you do and that's exactly what we're taught at school like you said and then we go to the workplace and it's completely different so um yeah like nithin mm -hmm. says yeah office got got Gossip is great and water cooler talks can't be done when you're at home, but they can because what we do is in if we're having a long meeting, we'll actually take a 10 minute break where we'll put everyone into breakout rooms and say have a coffee, right? Yeah. Um, I, I think it's a really uh, cool and fun thing to do. You know, the worst thing that the worst thing that at least this is my personal experience is throughout my life, I found that parasympathetic activity is frowned upon. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Taking time off, relaxing, talking at the water cooler is seen as, you know, non-productive waste of time. Man, the next person who says it to me, I'm, you know, barka, therapy. <laughs> <laughs> Um, listen, uh, I mean, I've just realized looking at the time, rather than do another breakout, why don't we just do this? Why don't we just ask everyone? Um, you know, we've got 12 minutes left. Um, yeah. Why don't you write down in the chat box one thing that you're taking away from this session that you're going to do differently now to look after your mental health or to help people around you look after their mental health? Um, and what we would love you to do, we're called Wake Up, Speak Up for a reason. We'd love you to um, actually post something on LinkedIn or on Facebook or whatever um, and tag Wake Up, Speak Up, right? Or, or tag Aman and myself and then we'll share it. Um, so that it's, we'd love to get a big list of things that people really think are going to make a difference to them. So perhaps if you could start by putting it in the chat box and then we can invite some people um, to... Um, uh, to, to kind of share. Um, if anyone has a point that they want to share right now, it would be great. Um, otherwise, Jeff, um, I'd love to know, is there something new that you heard of or learned about today that you'd like to take away? Zoha, Arpita, I'd love to hear from you. Before um, Barka disappears, because she's got a, a meeting uh, in 10 yes. minutes, um, I wanted to say, wonderful to meet you. And yeah. you, cha you changed my perception about the distance between Western psychology and the deeper kind of Vedic roots, which I, I've always felt were quite, you know, it's quite distant. But I think this, yeah, what you've said about the, the, the sort of shift towards understanding things on a quantum level, because um, I, I mean, I did physics as well, badly, but um, yeah, I, I think that's actually great. And I actually feel a bit more of a Reproachful. I don't feel quite such an alien living in um, Europe now, like an in, an Indian who's living in a, living in an English body. I actually, when I when I was in the Punjab about 25 years ago, I met this woman and she told me, "You've had many births in India, and your last birth was in Punjab." And she said, "You were fighting against the British, against <laughs> British rule." And I'm like, "So how come I'm born in Britain? I mean, you know, like what did I do? You killed too many of them." Probably, probably. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. That means a lot to me um, because I think that's what I, I, my hope for our field is that we can find a way to negotiate the Eastern and the Western and not see it as so opposing to each other. Because in the end, like what works for our clients, what works in terms of somebody's well being, that should be our goal. And I think over the last 20 years, there was a lot of like the versus, you know, this versus, which again creates disconnection and uh, yeah. more problems. Barka, thank you so much. I know you have a session to go to, so thank you so much. And um, having having you, we need you to scale and be all over India as fast as possible. <laughs> thank you for that. Thank you. Um, thank you. Paul, I like <laughs> so you, you, you're gonna um you're gonna start doing the coffee breakouts in long Zoom meetings. It really is quite fun. Um and I I really strongly recommend that. Anyone else um wanna share? what they're going to take away, what they're going to do. I think uh, my takeaway is that uh, we need to keep talking of it. There'll be resistance. There'll be people who may not agree to it. But once you've been through these kind of sessions and you understand that it's not you alone, it's just re 
reinforces your thought at least when i keep attending these kind of sessions where people say yes it's required it is a must so it becomes in many ways like a brand ambassador of good mental health because i am convinced that it's required the way it's required is through various ways but definitely there is a challenge in hand and uh, that maybe initially when i started off maybe 10 years back if you ask me i would have also pushed it under the carpet but then certain uh, real life experiences certain things and uh, aman and me have been talking on this on many occasions but the point is that we need to say i am the ceo or we need to say i am the vice president but i am feeling scared because there is a presentation and the investors are coming because scary getting afraid of a presentation and talking in front of my seniors it's a very natural thing so as long as you are able to say that this is me it's fine and thereafter once you get into the board room or once you get into wherever like i'm a pilot by profession in case of bad weather i need to at least talk to myself and say hey weather is bad i'm getting a little bit tense that is all once i say that to myself i am in so much in acceptance mode with myself that there is a challenge and thereafter i am not going to go and tell the passengers that i am feeling underconfident but i have to at least talk to myself so i think that's a very important thing that uh, we need to understand keep talking of it as much possible so that people mm-hmm. become aware and uh, they are ready to share and i also feel one last thing i want to make that unfortunately what is not seen is not acknowledged and mental health is something that will is not seen if you have a scar or you get hurt or you yes. you you know get something happens to you your mother father parents are going to say look there is where the hurt is the pain is go to a doctor it's a swollen ankle or a swollen knee but in case of mental health there maybe people don't understand it that's why we need to talk of the uh, symptoms of mental health and they have to be said in the manner of not saying that you are sick or there is something wrong with you it is just that the way you know you get a back pain if you go to the gym and exercise too much if you work too much and too hard and have too many aspirations you could have a challenge at your mind level i i feel this way yeah i i think that's really beautifully put nitin nitin and um you know maybe there is something in the nomenclature as well um it, you you may have heard of dr seligman and um positive psychology but um i i think it is about saying mental well-being or just well-being we should be talking about well-being as opposed to um mental health because that unfortunately is still stigmatized and that whole law of vulnerability let's all be open um and let you know the more we talk about this um it's it's incredible for us i mean i mean you and i were um we've had so many people who have talked about this um but the question is how many prioritize it and and getting people to prioritize is going to be a really big thing yeah yeah i think you know for for example one of the things that i i've been talking about to you and i want to do this and i want to put this out there now in front of a larger audience you know i've had this struggle of how do i make more time for parasympathetic contributing activities and one of the things i'm finally contemplating is i need to get myself an assistant so that i have i have somebody who can plan my day share my burden so i'm actually i'm putting this out there i'm actually going to start looking out for an assistant uh now so that i can make more sense of my god amni you know hire me hire me aman hire me how much will you do like barkha says you got this high performance high functioning anxiety <laughs> I, i was just going to say i mean you can't steal glenda she's my lifeline and she's the reason why i'm able to cope <laughs> to I say it's like glenda I she's on glenda. i'm just going to say a huge thank you um, to you because you keep me, you keep me saying Sorry, what was that, Aman? The clone Glenda, or ask Glenda. <laughs> Glenda, do you know anyone like yourself? <laughs> <laughs> just um, brilliant and um, it was really nice to see a few people bring up body mapping tiffany and ajit um it'd be really ajit maybe you start and then we can get tiffany to we, you know what what was it that really got you about that comment ajit yeah uh, i think uh, i mean in in the overall session uh, i meant that you know body mapping will be a basic takeaway for me because uh, many a times we deal with so many people around and uh, we really don't uh, sometimes understand who is somebody who is really training me or you know i keep uh, speaking but there is no other way responses but and there are somebody who really you know there are set of colleagues who really energizes you to speak more and to do more so uh, that that would be my one take away here that you know i really need to map that 
so that will be which will really help me uh, one but really point was for me was uh, how do we how do we uh, you know people who are who drains you how do we can we, is there a possibility to energize i mean you know from draining to energizing is there a way yeah. out so, yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Just, just you got to consciously list the things that energize you, and and you know work them into your day. Saying these are the three things that give me energy, I will do them every day. But I guess okay. what Ajit is saying is he's talking about what do you do with the people who drain you. Yeah. Um, Ajit, one of the things that I I did, it was a really difficult exercise. I looked at all the people that I really didn't like, and I tried to work out what it was about them that I didn't like. And actually, when it came down to it, I found that there, in some way, there was actually a jealousy there for me. I'm not saying that's the case for you. Mm -hmm. What I realized was um, maybe they were willing to just speak their mind and I wasn't. And I actually found that abrasive. Right. But why am I not speaking my mind in the same way? And so what I tried to do is once I kind of analyzed what it was for me, I, I then uh, brought in the value of curiosity and I would just whenever they talk I'd, I'd look at it through a curious lens rather than a you drain me lens and if you're aware of it it starts to alter the way you think so that that's just one idea okay the other one is to Thank spend you. yeah you know mm -hmm. it, the other one is to actually spend less time with them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's okay, that's easy. you know just <laughs> this just limit and say okay you know I'm, I'm going to spend exactly you know, 120 seconds talking to them and then I'm going to turn on my heel and go away. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. Right, Tiffany, 60 you. seconds. Okay, so Ajit, I want to just do one uh, one more final thing. Get a uh, get a timer, like one that flips over. Yeah. Maybe like a two minute timer, just like Amon said. That would be brilliant for you. Then you don't even have to have that cognitive timer going. When it runs out, it's like, okay, I'm busy now. Goodbye. Um, that might help you if, it, if you can't just uh, cut them out completely. As far as body mapping, I love the thought about performance management check-ins and emotional check-ins, because what I find is that um, I, ha I feel like I have a pretty good handle on mood, but um, what I'm finding is that there's things that I'm doing as I continue to expand my business, <laughs> my little tiny nothing business. I'm trying to, um, I'm, I'm trying to figure out um, what the emotions are that come up when I'm doing certain activities. And so I think that there's a realm of activities that, um, that I struggle with and it really brings my energy and just every, my whole life just comes crashing down in those moments. So I think that body mapping would help, that's all. Brilliant, brilliant. Aman, do you wanna close up then? All right, people, I must say thank you very much. Uh, this has by far been the most exciting Rusu that I have been part of, you know, and I've been part of eight more than any one of you, uh, except for Glenda and, you know, Pandana. <laughs> but I, I've had a great time. This has been interactive, it's been important, it's been fun. You guys have contributed in, in wonderful ways. So thank you so much uh, for being here. Our, uh, our next episode, we are actually planning to uh, focus on uh, another very, a uh, very important topic to us, uh, to all of us. It's called the economic system. Has it failed humanity? That's what we're going to be talking about next time. So, um, you know, so we'll, and, you know, we'll post soon about uh, when those dates are. And if that topic interests you as much as this one, we hope to see you there again. Okay, Thank brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Glenda, for working behind the scenes and um, look forward to seeing you at that next one. Thank you. All right. Take care, everyone. Take care, people. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye -bye. Jeff, did you see Nitin's question, incidentally? Where is Jeff? Jeff, oh, Jeff dropped off quickly. <laughs> I keep, I, mean, I keep asking many a question. So which one was this? This was, you know, when when he, when he said that, uh, you know, I was a Punjabi in my last birth and when he said, do you like the Nuri chicken? <laughs> oh, I wondered where that came from. I was trying to work out why are they talking about but that? Know, because, he said, because he said somebody looked at him and said he must have been an Indian. So I thought... Yeah.